Hello, David Zritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. Do I have a treat today? And yes, this is one of those amazing exclusives that you only dream of, especially if you're into the literary bond. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Anthony Horowitz. Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, David. Lovely to be talking to you. Lovely to be talking to you as well. And I'll tell you what, before we started recording, I, I did have a, a little bit of a confession that I am a huge fan of your work, truly. Well, that's very kind of you. It's a very nice start to a, to a conversation. So I appreciate it, it. It's a little nicer, right? As opposed to uh, <laughs> gunning for you. I started by saying, God, how could you write three such terrible bun novels? But, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm happier with you liking them. These are page turners. And I'll tell you, today we're doing this as a, a major celebration. Uh, as this video is appearing to my audience, we have the paperback version of With a Mind to Kill. And I, I've got I've to roll it back for a moment because I'm always interested in the journey of somebody like Anthony Horowitz. So roll it back for me. I'm curious, when you were writing, for example, the Alex Ryder series, another series I'm a huge fan of, did your mind ever wander to the thoughts of, you know, this might be interesting if I ever wrote a James Bond novel? Well, I mean, first of all, obviously, Alex comes out of James Bond. You know, I've been a great fan, a lover of the books in particular, but also the movies since I was about 10 years old. When I was, I think, nine, our Doctor No, the first Bond movie came out in the in the movie theaters. And, and Bond has always been a huge part of my life. And Alex Ryder was was largely inspired by watching the last of the Roger Moore movies. I always liked Moore as Bond, and I've got no criticism against him, but he was getting on a little bit by the time he made A View to a Kill. And the thought was, would, wouldn't it be great if, if Bond was a teenager? So that, that was really the start of it. And I, I didn't follow that idea. I banked it in my head for five years, but there was a side to me that had always wanted to write James Bond, to write a movie, to write a book, to write something in the world of Bond. And, and my entry into, into the world of Bond came quite a bit later, after Alex Ryder, when the, um, the uh, estate approached me to write the first of the books. But by then, they'd already asked three different writers, so I was getting a little bit impatient. Um, I'm sort of muddling myself up here, because what I was going to say was, was that Alex Ryder was my answer to that enigma originally. Mm -hmm. If you want to write Bond, but you can't write Bond, create your own Bond. So I created Alex Ryder. And then 10, 20 years later, I managed to get into the world of the real Bond. God, I love it. Cool, even as I say that, because Alex is nothing like Bond. He's very different. He was simply inspired by that world. But I love how you're describing this. It's almost like Alex Ryder scratched that itch. But just like any good itch, it's still there. It still needs to be scratched. Now, you're putting it exactly right. I mean, you know, the thing about Alex was he was inspired by Bond. He is a spy, and there are plenty of things in the books that refer directly to the to the Bond world. I mean, you know, the very fact that his teacher is called Mr. Donovan at school, you know, people will know who I'm talking about. Another character called Bernard Miles turns up somewhere in those books. You know, there are full Easter eggs all the way, and it's, if you like, me having a smile at the world of Bond. Whilst at the same time trying to do something that was very different. Alex is, after all, 14 or 15 years old in the first book. He doesn't want to be a spy. He's not a patriot. Uh, the people he works for, Alan Blunt, named after a traitor, not anybody like M, but the exact opposite it, the sort of more modern secret service that we don't so much trust anymore. That was all meant to be very different. But at the same time, it allowed me, if you were like, to sort of to, to live the Bond dream in, in a sort of a different guise. You did it. And now I, I'll tell you, I'm going to pull a Barbara Walters moment on you of, you know, what is the emotion when you get tapped on the shoulder to finally write that Bond book? What is the emotion and, and what's the process? Is it a phone call? Is it more formal? Well, the estate, the Ian Fleming estate, had first of all gone to Sebastian Fawkes, who wrote Devil May Care, then they went to Jeffrey Deaver, then they went to William Boyd, and I was watching these authors with a certain amount, I will be honest, of just sheer jealousy and envy. I mean, I, why not me? When is the phone going to ring? And eventually it did. And I have to say, that I wouldn't have waited a great deal of longer before I got really miffed and said no. But I was the fourth time round when finally a lady called Corin Turner, who sort of helps to run the, the Fleming estate, did call me. And... I, I sort of, you know, without wishing to be arrogant, because, you know, I'm an enormous admirer of Ian Fleming, and I do not think it is easy to follow in his footsteps at all. He is a very considerable writer. But I had always thought that if anybody could do the job, it was me, because, first of all, there was Alex. But secondly, you know, I, I had written adult novels. I'd done Sherlock Holmes. I had proven that I was able to sort of 
and ventriloquize, take the voice of another writer better than me and produce a book. So I sort of was getting a little bit fretful and saying, well, when are they going to call me? But when they did, I have to say it was a wonderful moment. It was a sense of, of having arrived, of having th this was the book. Trigger mortis that I had been born, if you like, to write, and and the Fleming estate could not have been kinder or more supportive or more generous. It's been a wonderful experience throughout. I've heard that before from people that the the Ian Fleming publications they're incredibly generous and and embracing of your style. So it it, it just logically creates a question: Was there a Bond Bible? Was there restrictions, parameters that you had to follow where they said stay within your guidelines? Well, first, let me say that when I went to the original meeting with the estate, I was so nervous. It was as if I was going to meet Smirsh. I mean, I was, I, I remember wearing, I, I wore a suit. I had to go into this bank in, in the middle of London, the Fleming Bank. And, you know, there they were around the board. I was the only one in the room wearing a suit. They were all so casual, so friendly, so easygoing. I felt ridiculous from the very start. But in terms of, of, of rule books and laws, no, there weren't. I mean, I am a Bond purist. I mean, by that I am an e mean I am an Ian Fleming purist. And my job, after all, is almost to ignore the world of the movies and just write the Bond of the books. And so they didn't need to tell me what Fleming would or would not have liked. I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed of writing anything that would have undermined his vision of his character or his world. They had a control. I mean, I'll give you a very good example of, of a, an early debate we had. In Trigger Mortis, I wanted Pussy Galore to turn up as a character. As far as I can see, nobody had ever brought back one of the love interests out of the books. And I was always fascinated, in a way, by what happened. You know, at the end of, of Goldfinger, the plane, the stratosphere crashes into the sea, and the two of them are saved and rescued. And you think to yourself, you know, they're going to have a short relationship, but, but, but what's going to go wrong? I mean, in some of the books, Bond does mention sort of past women that he has right. been with and it's never ended happily uh, of course but but what does go wrong and I wanted to explore that and, and it, I thought it was a good idea and the, the estate was quite nervous about it they didn't like the idea to begin with and and I think they were concerned that maybe pussy law might divide public opinion as to whether it is good to to celebrate that sort of character so they had a debate about it and they took a vote and they decided to let me go ahead if they had said no, I'm not sure what would have happened, uh, whether I'd have rolled over or stamped my feet or what, but they didn't. So that was the sort of thing. I'll tell you one other, one other little thing. It always makes me smile when I re re recollect this. I remember the one thing they didn't like in the first book, Sugar Mortis, which was rather corrected, was that I had Bond sleeping naked, and they said he never did. And I remember them saying, I forget who it was within the family, said, you know, what he wears in the books is a bed jacket. And a bed jacket is like a sort of a, a shirt that's close to your neck and goes all your way to the knees. And I thought to myself, if there is one piece of clothing in the world that I am not going to put James Bond in, it is a bed jacket. I forget what the compromise was, but it certainly didn't appear. I like that you didn't. I, I just would have popped so many cool balloons for me. Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, So you said something, too, that just it's fascinating me. It's not even a question I had down, but you, you're, you said... You're a literary Bond fan, you, you love the movies, but you weren't about writing the movies. Did the movies ever infest your imagination? Did you suddenly, you were writing away and suddenly Roger Moore or Sean Connery's voice crept into your head? Or were you able to successfully block that? No, I always had Sean Connery's voice in my head. Every single word I, I wrote for Bond, I imagined Sean Connery speaking. Uh, obviously because of my age, he is my favorite Bond because he was the first Bond. He was the Bond I grew up with, and therefore I have a huge fondness for him. I'm not saying that the other actors weren't equally good in different ways, but nonetheless, he is the one that I remember most. And if you ask me my favorite Bond films, it's going to be from Russia with Love, Doctor No, Goldfinger above all. Goldfinger, actually probably my favorite book too. Uh, but but um, at the same time, I did see occasionally Daniel Craig. And when I was imagining some of the action sequences, I, I, particularly, I suppose, the um, sequence in London Bridge, which you get in with A Mind to Kill, which is a really big action set piece, I am, to a certain extent, seeing the sort of the style and the, and the size and the, and the imagination of the Bond movies and trying to sort of instill that to try and bring that into the books. I feel that. I feel that in that in that portion of the book where the grandeur that you talk about and the gravitas that sometimes only a movie can create. I do I do want to get into because I had a, a series of questions. Um, there's a, a big fan of yours out there named Roland Hulme, who's another uh, accomplished author. 
but he wanted to know, and, and this is fascinating, plotter versus panster. So for those that don't oh. know what that is, uh, are you the type of author that creates an overarching plot or you fly by the seat of your pants, sometimes like Fleming was? A, a, you know, I had never heard that phrase before, plotter or panster. And I was at Hampton, East Hampton, just a week ago doing a wonderful festival there, which I had a lovely time. And everybody was talking about that. Are you a plotter or a pantser? Well, I can tell you straight off, I'm a plotter. I spend an awful lot of time working with notebooks and diagrams, drawings. I ask myself questions. I do not really write a single word of a book until I have it structured pretty much 90% of it. The beginning, the middle, the end. That said, just because I structure everything terribly carefully doesn't mean I have to actually follow the structure. That's the beauty of a structure. It doesn't tie you down. It frees you. So that if you've got Bond, I don't know, jumping off the roof of a building and you decide actually he's going to fall and break both his legs, you can do that provided you know that he can get to the end of the book, you know, you know in another way. You know, that there is another route to the end of your book. Yeah. Every single thing that happens in a book has a choice. You can go one way the way you intended or the way you, that surprises you. But because you've got a structure, you know if it'll work. Incidentally, Bond could not break both his legs jumping off a building. That was a bad example because, <laughs> you know, again, that's not something that happens in the books. As far as I know, despite his many, many injuries in the books, the only bone I can remember him breaking is in Live and Let Die. And it's a bone of his little finger. Oh, that's Am right. I right? Yes. Somebody, in your, somebody watching this will say, no, 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 there's another broken bone for Bond. But, they'll, um, they'll let us know in the comments section. They're ruthless. But, but, yeah, but, uh, live and let die. Uh, his finger is actually broken on purpose. Horrible, brilliantly written sequence. Amazingly so. Well, so, all right. Based on that, you go into this with as, as a plotter, as you're saying. Did they tell you right in the beginning that this was going to be a trilogy? Absolutely not. I mean, when I first went to my first meeting at the bank, I had with me a sort of a three or four page synopsis, the plot of Trigger Mortis, and, and we discussed it and they liked it. And, and, I, I, and, and I went away and wrote it. And then it came out and I was very lucky because what had happened was, was that their, their plan, which was to do a new writer with every book, um, had only worked to a certain extent. And the trouble with it was there was no continuity. If people loved Sebastian Fuchs's book, they wanted another one, and, and there wasn't. So I think they decided that maybe they would try a new direction of having one author doing more than one book. So they came to me and said, would you do another one, which then turned out to be forever and a day. I was thrilled. I'd already had this sort of idea, the opening line of the book. So 007 is dead was in my head. And I really wanted to write that line and to write the continuation of what happened there. So I immediately said yes and then wrote that one. And again, I think it also helped with both the books were well received by the Bond community, if you like. And I was very surprised when they then said after the second one, why not a third? And by then I'd done the middle of Bond's career. I'd done the beginning of Bond's career. So it seemed sort of sensible and satisfying to, to complete the trilogy. And I do not think of it as a trilogy with a mind to kill and, um, and, to, and, to, and to do the book uh, at the end of his career in 1963. Which was so genius. And by the way, speaking of uh, being well received, I remember so vividly reading Trigger Mortis and calling one of my good friends and saying, have you, have you consumed this yet? I mean, I am literally hearing Ian Fleming's writing and voice. And it begs the question of how did you do that? I mean, did you ever process? Because the voice connection and the extension of that and the extension of him seems flawless. Truly, I mean that. Well, you, it's kind of to say, I mean, the, the, things to be, the, the two things to be said here, that first of all, before I wrote the books, I reread them. I read, read all of them, all 14, and immersed myself in them and not just read them, but really studied them and, and wrote page after page of, of just lines of dialogue and, and Fleming's way of describing things, which is extremely difficult to, um, to, to imitate because it's such a unique voice. And his way, his use of language is so clever because it's, he doesn't use elaborate words or elaborate descriptions, but he just has a way of a turn of phrase that only he, it's such, a, it's such a unique voice. And I was trying in every single paragraph I wrote to emulate that. And, was, and the, the second thing is, is to know my place, to, to recognize that I am nowhere near as good a writer as Fleming. I am invisible in this book. I am, you know, I'm channeling his voice, his style, 
his way of doing things and and that that my own ego and my desire to be the sort of the, you know the guy with the big name on the cover has got to a certain extent to be sort of subdued and underneath it all so it's a it's an act of both of of, of reverence and but also one of of inspiration because if you're given these characters and this world half your work has been done for you you know it is that they're, they're so wonderful every single character from you know from from may the housekeeper through to the sort of the the villain of the piece whoever he or she may be um it's a, you know the, the world is so brilliantly defined that that to find yourself in it living in it and recreating it just as a pure joy. I love that. So I have to ask a question. You talked about other authors. W were you familiar or were you well read on the continuation novels that were sort of outside the realm of Fleming? Oh, good heavens. Yes, I'd read pretty much all of them. I mean, you know, um, I, I, my favorite always was Robert Markham or Kingsley Amis, Colonel's Son, which I think is better than my books and, and as good as any of it have been done. Um, but also, um, Gosh, remind me who that who I should be thinking about here. Um, uh, Raymond Benson. Raymond Benson wrote Gardner. I thought his were terrific, and he seems a very nice guy. We've had a few exchanges on Twitter, and of course, John Gardner. Um, I had read um, as the books came out. I didn't like all of them. I think perhaps he wrote too many, and perhaps he wrote them too quickly by the end. But nonetheless, there are some wonderful sequences within those books that are pure in Fleming. Charlie Hickson, the Young Bond books, I thought were very, very good and well done as well. So you know, and and, and you know, let's not forget my you know the contemporary writers who all produce interesting books. Uh, you know, Sebastian Fulks, etc. And Carte Blanche, the best of all the new Bond titles uh, from Jeffrey Deaver. So so you know, it was a, it was a very good company to be part of. I love that. So let's talk about tone, because there's a certain tone that your books hit. For example, the, the trilogy has very three different versions. Trigger Mortis, I, I consider is sort of the peak Bond. Forever in a Day is more raw, optimistic, young Bond. And then this one that we're looking at today with A Mind to Kill is a little bit more cynical, defeated Bond. So was that a very conscious move on your part to create those overlapping tones for each book? I didn't have a game plan when I began. I mean, Trigger Mortis, one week after Goldfinger, uh, it seemed obvious to me because, as I've said, Goldfinger was almost my favourite book and film, and I loved Pussy Galore, and it was just seemed, it seemed a very natural choice, mid-career, right in the middle of things, with a very, instead of quite a cinema, well, I can say almost a cinematic plot. It's a very big plot. This is a guy, you know, by the time you get to With a Mind to Kill, the plot is actually quite intimate and small. You know, what the, what the final twist is, it will change the world, but it's not like blowing up a rocket and, and, and making the Empire State Building fall down, which is what sort of is the plot of Trigger Mortis. Yeah. So it was very, very classic Bond. And then Forever and a Day, as you say, younger, having done the middle one, I thought this idea of examining Bond straight after Casino Royale Fleming has told us how, um, sorry, straight before Casino Royale, Fleming had given us clues as to how Bond got his 007 number, that there was a killing in, in uh, you know, in one city and then a, in New York, a, 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 um, somebody shot at a skyscraper. Uh, but I wanted to look at, look at those a little more closely and look at the making of the man. And then having written those two, when the Fleming estate came back, as I said, I then saw a trilogy and realised I had to go to the end of it. And, and this book, Mind to Kill, very much inspired by the opening chapters of, of, um, of The Man with the Golden Gun, which have always been some of my favorite chapters in the whole Bond canon. For me, the best part, the books, the parts of the book I most enjoyed were always Bond and M. That was also true of the films in Sydney. I loved Bernard Lee and Judy Dench in the parts yeah. of, of M. And the relationship between that sort of, you know, the maternal paternal figure of a school teacher to the to the to the star pupil, the you know, the 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 the, the, the boss who who inspires such loyalty and devotion, and yet who is somehow still so distant. I mean, I love that section in Moonraker in the beginning of the book of Moonraker, where Bond yes. and, and M go and play cards at Blades. I mean, it's and and you get that sense of just respect mutual respect and friendship and 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 you know, these are the two guys who are saving the world um and and therefore to start with the sort of the distaff side of that which of course the man with the golden gun bond is sent to kill m was to me irresistible yeah I, I well first of all thank you for not resisting because you were able to obviously build that into a mold the the interesting thing for me to observe, just even in this short conversation, is you are so clearly 
passionate and enthusiastic about Ian Fleming. So it begs the question, do you have a favorite Fleming novel? Well, I've said Goldfinger is one of them. Um, and I also love Moonraker. Um, I think Gala Brand is a terrific character. And I love the, although I have never played bridge in my life and never will, somehow, and this is his genius, Fleming makes that opening bridge game with Hugo Drax so exciting and so psychologically apposite and, and apt and clever. So I love that book. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there isn't, of course, there isn't, any, there isn't a Bond novel I don't like. I mean, one of the ones I absolutely love is Quantum of Solace. It's a mm. short story that appears sort of quite late in the collection and feels like not a Bond novel at all. He's just a, a guest at the dinner party. And it's clearly uh, a story very much inspired by Somerset Maugham, I'd have thought. But nonetheless, the writing of it, the personality, the character in there, the sort of the lesson that's learned. It, it's, it's very, very far from my favourite Bond film, I have to say, but, but it is one of my favourite stories. What don't you like about Quantum of Solace, the film? I can't imagine what it is now. I think um, <laughs> uh, I think it's best passed over quietly. No, it was, listen, it's not a terrible film. It's got some great sequences in it. The opera sequence is fantastic. There's a rooftop chase, I seem to remember, in that one, which I like very much. Oh, yes, I think it was the editing. It was the editing, the fast-cutting editing that just left me sort of bedazzled. Maybe I was too old for it. Well, you know what it is, too, is I read with a mind to a kill. If I thought about it as a movie, the story is so fluid. It's liquid. It, I, I really, I've described it as being liquid because it flows so perfectly that when you see something like Quantum of Solace, the editing of that film is so chopped up. It doesn't really connect all the parts and pieces together. It's very kind of you to say, David. I, I, I thank you. Um, I think, you know, my wife has said of, of the three Bond novels, this one is my best. She also actually thinks it's one of my best books of all the 55 or so books that I've written in my life. Wow. And I think that it was very much inspired by my knowledge that it was going to be my last one and I wasn't going to disappoint people. It, it had to be very good. And I think that when I was constructing the plot, I, even more so than in the first two books, because I wasn't doing the sort of the Mr. Big, the sort of the, you know, the Goldfinger style megalomaniac who wants to destroy the world, but somebody who is much smaller. Colonel Boris is the villain of this book, actually an Ian Fleming character, although we never meet him in the books, we merely hear his name a couple of times mentioned. So wonderful to take him over. But because of that, I had, I think I was more into creating more of a labyrinth, more, you know, with more twists and turns and surprises than you would find even in an Ian Fleming novel, because they do tend to be, and I'm not saying this as an, an insulting way, but they tend to be quite lateral, the books. They don't sort of, right. you know, oh my goodness, I hadn't seen that coming. Uh, that's, that's not what he's into. In this one, I allowed myself that liberty because it was much more psychological. It's a cat and mouse game and, and, and such. And, and, and you know, I, I was very happy with the, with the construction of the plot. And when I began writing it, that's what really motivated me through it, even more than getting to the big set pieces. Uh, my favourite being, incidentally, the fight on the uh, platform of a, of a, of a Russian uh, subway station, which I loved writing because I thought to myself, that to me really does somehow go back to From Russia With Love. And it's sort of a sequence I could really see Fleming writing himself. So we know your wife's favorite of the three. Is this also your favorite with A Mind to Kill? I, t I find it very difficult ever to sort of choose favorites amongst my books because, you know, it's like asking, a, a, you know, someone their favorite child. Um, I have a favorite child. Uh, who is your favorite child? It's my son, not my daughter. Oh, no. I hope and now it's public. This podcast. Um, <laughs> Oh, no, no, but I understand. It's almost like a Sophie's Choice situation for you. <laughs> well, okay, of the three books, I don't know. No, yes, it is. Yes, it is probably my favourite of the three. Although that said, you know, I think Colonel uh, Miss Sin, Jason Sin, in, in Trigger Mortis is my favourite of the villains. I absolutely love the pack of cards that he uses to determine the way he's going to kill his enemies. I think that, again, is something Fleming might well have done and would have enjoyed. But that said, the death of the villain at the end of um, uh, Forever and a Day, which I adored writing, again, has overtones of Goldfinger and, 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 and sort of just, you know, the, the, the larger-than-life villain dying, a larger-than-life death, like Mr. Big at the end of Live and Let Die. So that's my favourite death. So I can find my favourite things in all three of the books without wishing to instantly I hope I'm not sounding too much like I'm shouting my blowing my own trumpet about these books you ask me my own personal yes. opinion of personal passions this is what makes me smile I love that and by the way there, there's 
So I have to try to try to be a mouthpiece to some of the bond community in the sense that this paper book that comes out today that, with a mind to kill, so many people have been waiting for this for the very simple reason. I think you're going to, as a, as a literary fan of, of Fleming, I think you'll commiserate with this. They've been looking for the paperback version because they want to take it with them on the go. They want to put it into their attache case. I've, I've heard people say they're going to take it out in their vacations and take pictures of it by the pool and on the sand. As a writer, is there a certain appreciation that with a mind to kill the paperback is going to travel with the Bond fan? Well, there are two things to say here. The first is that I love, I personally love hardcovers. I mean, I am a, I have all hardcover editions of, of the Bond novels. I buy first editions when I can find them. I, uh, I, I love, I love books. I love the, the physicality of books. But I love, as you correctly say, the sort of availability of softcover books, paperbacks, um, that, you know, they can travel with you. They can go with you. They slip into a case. The only books, are, you know, I don't often read ebooks anymore because I love paper. And the new paperback edition of, of The Mind to Kill looks great. And, yeah, I think it is terrific that it can, that it can you know, it can come with you. It, you know, you, you almost wish that they had a button you could press and something would shoot out of the spine. Because uh, that would make it truly modern. But uh, why? Why didn't they do a collector's version of that? I love that idea. Well, I did quite like the fact that when they make trigger mortis, you could cut the cover up and turn it into a rocket, which I thought was yes. very imaginative. I never did myself. I preferred the book whole, but still. Although I tell you what, as as clearly you could tell by my accent, as an American, you in the UK get all the best covers. We do not. You say that, but funnily enough, in my other series of books, the Hawthorne series, which I'm at the moment writing number five of, a detective series, the English publisher is jealous of the American covers and has now emulated them. So the American covers Ooh. have been rejigged slightly and brought over to the UK. Um, I think that, you know, covers are very, very difficult. When it comes to James Bond, nobody can beat Richard Chopping, who was the original, well, actually the original yes. cover artist of the books was, of course, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who designed oh the first covers? Oh, I, I, I'm at a loss. <laughs> I pass. Yeah, David. It was Ian Fleming himself. He designed the cover for Casino Royale and for Moonraker. Um, then Richard Chopping came in a bit later and just started doing these absolutely wonderful covers. Uh, and um, and they're the ones that the people still remember. You know, the, the playing card with the knife through it and that sort of thing, and the skeleton hand. That's yes. Thunderball, um, I think. Uh, I'm reading a mashup. But anyway... Um, it's difficult to get the covers right. I don't know. Have you seen the new covers of the paperbacks that the, that the estate have just released? You know, I have. Their opinion. I think they're pretty cool. Some people like them less. Some people like them more. But I, I think they've done a good job. I, I, and I do. I, I actually do quite like the covers. That, in fact, was part of the impetus of, I think, the covers in the UK are a little bit nicer than the ones in the US. Well, Again, some just of them are. I mean, there was a cover that showed, a, 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 I think it was for Chugga Mortis, which had a young woman it seemed to be drowning and i really disliked that cover i thought that that was a big mm. mistake you know covers have got the i in my view the covers should have an element of fun in them uh an element you know the the, the, the soft cover cut here is is quite dark and grim but that does sort of fit the the mood of the book to a bit and, and i love the, the big white letters on it i think it, it's a good cover um but but i i do like the wit of covers we had a great cover done for um the second in the series, uh, Forever and a Day, which has um, a, a, a something, it looks like it's the surface of the sea, the ocean, and there is a line crossing it in a boat, uh, and that's the wake from the boat. But when you turn round, the back of the book is a gun shooting, and so the bullet is, as it were, travelling round the book and becoming the wake of a boat. And I thought that was really clever, very much in the world of sort of chopping and of Fleming. I loved it. I love it when it, it's, it's dimensional. It tells a story to itself yeah, visually. Exactly. That's the best. So I... This is such a positive conversation. I, I promise I'm going to end this on a positive note because this is a celebration of your paper book. But of course, I have to ask you if you have any opinions on any of the editing of some of the Fleming novels to make them more embraceable by some people. Well, my answer to that, David, is, um, and I hope this isn't the last question because it is slightly negative, um, but I would just simply say that my view is that the work of dead authors should be left untouched. I think on, there is no reason to change a single word of any book written by an author who is not around to defend himself, no matter how well-meaning you may be. And there, the main reason for this is that 
you are feeding an appetite that is insatiable. Because if you start with five words on one book, they'll want 15 words in the next book, 50 in the book after that, and they won't want the book after that at all. That demand for sort of political correctness or wokeness, whatever you want to call it, is insatiable. So don't give away a word. Now, I don't mind warnings. If you really think it's necessary to put into the front of a book that the language here is used in the, from the 1940s and 50s and, uh, and, and you know, that was how people thought and wrote at that time and that some people therefore might be offended by it, that's fine because that gives people the choice not to buy it. I don't even mind if you want to produce a copy of a book which has been expunged provided, provided that the original copy is still available. So my answer to your question is not a criticism of the Ian Fleming publishers or the Ian Fleming family or whoever is making changes to these books. It is blanket. It is all books. It is Roald Dahl. It is Agatha Christie. It is any book you care to mention because at the end of the day, given to this type of thinking, and you'll end up with no books at all. So, Anthony, as I suspected, you and I are cut from the same exact cloth. I had recommended that same thing in the very beginning to put a, a slight warning and actually even more so a call to action for people to discuss the book with others. And in fact, three years ago, I started a, a global James Bond readers video. And, and there's many that it now exist of Fleming's novels where we read them, discussed them in a multicultural group globally. And we had a most wonderful time because, you know, if we don't discuss our past, how do we shape our future? Absolutely right, David. I'm totally with you on that. And I think that's what you're doing is terrific. But, you know, the important thing is that, you know, if one reads the, the biggest culprit and the one that causes the most angst is live and let die, which, of course, <laughs> includes the N-word many, many times, I think it is valuable to us to understand that that word was used in that time and at the same time to to be aware and almost to congratulate ourselves on the fact that we no longer use such pejoratives now we have learned we are in the 21st century we are no longer in 1950 that book was written i think in about 55 56 um so so the the language and the mores of times gone by are an important guide to how we are now. They are a measuring stone to how far we have traveled and how much more enlightened we have become. But by removing the past, by cutting it away, by destroying it or ignoring it, you then have nothing to guide, to, to, to compare yourself to. So you're doing yourself really a disservice. I love it. I love it. All right. So we're going to end this discussion by really talking about your readers and your book. So right now, again, as I said, the paperback's available. You can see the link down below, but you can also have that wonderful experience of walking into a bookstore. Remember those, ladies and gentlemen? And smelling the pulp and, and you know, running your fingers through it. Anthony, what do you hope and expect the readers of this book with a mind to a kill are going to get out of consuming it? An adventure, lots of surprises, lots of action interesting characters, and a sort of an immersion in the world of Bond, the true world of Bond, the purest world of Bond, which is set in its correct time, which is the 60s, the earlier ones were in the 50s, uh, but, but, you know, in the time when Bond was alive, that you don't need to worry, despite what we were discussing a moment ago about language and such, I am very careful not to use offensive language or offensive attitudes, that's a, another side of my job. I would have really boil it down to, to a, a terrible cliche, David, a good read. That's all I'm trying to offer, an entertainment, something people will enjoy. Who could ask for anything more? That's Truly. That's not a Bond quote, but still. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, world is not enough. It, it sums it up. Absolutely right. Thank you. That's exactly what I'm hoping for. I love it. By the way, this is so unfair to ask, but I'm going to throw this one at you as a bonus. Do you have a fourth in you, perhaps? Well, again, as somebody said, never say never. But... <laughs> As I'm sitting here, I think my job is done and I'm very, very happy with that trilogy and time to move on. Love it. Love it. Well, we're going to move on to the bookstore or to Amazon because this is an incredible read. And Anthony, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Truly appreciate it. It's been a pleasure talking to you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And of course, this has also been David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience. And we'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be 
up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're gonna get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.